higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant in the trial and the change Oh, just one thing Remains I love how high you are, Jesus Higher than the mountains that I face I love how strong Stronger than the power of the grave Oh, Jesus Constant in the trial
And I want you to picture the person who has been the most faithful friend that you know in your life. You could even, if you have more than one faithful person in your life, you could picture a couple. And I just want you to see them smiling at you this morning. Those faithful people in your life. And you can even thank God for those people. Thank you, God, for those people. Maybe think of another person. Maybe there's somebody that in your childhood who was just such a faithful friend. Maybe it's just one person. Maybe it's a family member or a mother or a father. And just see them smiling at you this morning. And you can thank God if you'd like for them. Now, all those faces are just a, not even a fraction of the love and the faithfulness of your Father in heaven. I want you to picture God as a Father. And you could even use the faces of the people that have been kind and, and faithful as friends to you over the years. If you don't have an image in your mind. And just see God is smiling at you this morning. In the face of Jesus, in the face of the Father through these through these people. And there's so much love for each one of us this morning. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. It just keeps going and going. Every morning his mercies are new. Brand spanking new. Brand new, brand new. Yeah, that's good. 
past your mind. Sometimes our mind gets in the way. Just receive what the Spirit is doing here. This isn't anything a man can give. Anything a song or a word. It's what the Holy Spirit gives to our spirit. We are spirit bodies. I like to call them we're spirit bodies or we're spirit beings in a meat suit like in a human body you're not your body you're a spirit being and the spirit wants to come right now and attach himself to your spirit and give you life let's receive
morning, which basically means that God speaks to us and he shares things with us. And he is really on the move this morning. A number of people have some amazing, beautiful words that God wants to share to encourage your hearts today. One of, um, I'm going to have Brenda come up first. Good morning. When we were worshiping, I saw a picture of God's love just falling like, like rain, like warm rain. And what I saw, it was soaking in on some people, but on some people it was just bouncing off. And I felt the Lord wanted to tell you, to the ones that it was bouncing off, that He loves you. In Jeremiah 31 it says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. With loving kindness I'm drawing you. Again, I will build you and rebuild you. And you will go with the, the dancers and the people that worship the Lord. Anyway, the Lord just wanted me to encourage you that His love will never fail you, and He truly is drawing you with His loving kindness. He loves you. One of the scriptures that came into my heart this morning is Colossians 1.27, and basically says, Christ in you, the hope of glory, and that Christ has called us to represent Him to the world. And <clears throat> to to show the world that God is a God of love and grace and mercy and and but when I when I was thinking about that and praying on that I, what came into my heart is some of you are like I can't represent Jesus <coughs> how can I be a representation of Christ I I yelled at my wife or my spouse and I, and I think thoughts that aren't so good and and and. And I've done these things that aren't so good. And, and the enemy's like, yeah, 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 look at your past. You're so unworthy. You're, you, you, you can't represent Christ. But God says, look at your future. Look at your future. Look what I have for you. And so right now, I just feel really strongly, even in my own heart, is, is to repent. And repent means to turn around. It means to change course. So, so if you feel like you've grieved God and that you hurt his heart because I I don't want to hurt God's heart. And just place your hand over your heart right now if you feel led and just say, God, forgive me. Forgive me, God. I want to represent you. Forgive me, Holy Spirit, how I grieved you. And so, Father, we repent of that. And we want to turn from that, God, because we want to be representations of you, the hope and glory to a world that is dying, a world that is hurting and in pain. And so, God, forgive us. We ask this in your mighty, precious name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And see, that's how simple it is. It's not complicated. When you grieve the spirit or you hurt somebody, you say, I'm sorry. I repent. And then God cleanses it off. Amen? Daniel. So this morning, um, the Lord brought me to Psalm 105 and spoke to me as a reminder that this is not complicated. This is very simple. He said, oh, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all of his wondrous works and glory in his holy name. 
Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence continually. And remember the wondrous works that He has done, His miracles and the judgments He uttered. The Lord asked me to um, read this prophecy to you about what he's doing. He wants you to know what he's doing. It's a little bit long, but I'm going to try and go as fast as I can. I heard the Lord say, I'm reactivating those who have been knocked out and around in the battles. This week we were driving, I saw a sign about reactivating those who come back from, from war. This is by uh, Lana. Advisor. When I saw the sign, it was 3D to me in the spirit, and the Lord spoke to me. I'm reactivating those who have been knocked out and around in the battles. Reactivate means to restore to a state of activity, bring back into action, revitalize, awaken, renew, regenerate, resurrection. This prophetic word is for those of you who have been in battles, whether it's been a very long battle or a recent battle. The Lord is sending forth encouragement to you. He's sending forth an invitation to you to align your faith and agreement with Him. There's a divine reactivation upon you right now. It's a divine reaction by the hand of God and the power of the Spirit. The Lord knows you have been through an intense battle he knows how hard the battle's been. He knows how you fought. He knows how you've been knocked around in the battle. Many of you are very weary. Many of you are discouraged, disappointed, and hurting. There are others of you who deep down in areas of your heart, you've given up the fight. You're just too tired from the battle. There are others of you who feel you just cannot believe for more or continue to run. There are others of you who feel so disoriented from the battle. You don't know which way is up. There are others of you who have lost confidence in the voice of God in your life because there's been so much disappointment and confusion. There are others of you who are simply exhausted. Whatever level of battle weariness you find yourself in, this word is for you. The power of His Spirit is upon you now to bring rejuvenation, to bring a great awakening, to strengthen you, to restore you. I heard the Lord say, get ready for resurrection. The resurrection power of God is coming upon you strongly to revive you and cause you to come back into the place of action. Not only is the Lord restoring you and getting you back on your feet again, He's reviving and restoring you to stronger than you've ever been in Him. These are the days of the empowered. I heard the Lord say, these are the days of the empowered. These are the days of monumental demonstration of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit is going to be displayed in so many grand and stunning ways in this era. One of them will be in repositioning, the revival, the restoration, the awakening, the resurrection of those who've been almost crushed and taken out by the battles. He continued to whisper, restored in a day. There was such a realm of faith that surrounded me. I could feel the Lord whispering and challenging his people. Can I restore all and more in a day? The power of the Holy Spirit is going to be demonstrated so magnificently as thousands upon thousands of testimonies will arise all over the globe from people who see the hand of the Lord restore all and more in a day major restoration and reactivation in a moment. Many have been plagued with the sinking feeling of so much lost time, wasted, because of so many intense battles. But the Lord wants to encourage His people that there are miracles of restoration and activation in a day that are and will continue to take place. He stooped down to lift me out of danger. From the desolate pit I was in, 
out of the muddy mess I had fallen into. Now he has lifted me up into a firm, secure place and steadied me while I walk along his ascending path. A new song for a new day rises up in me. Every time I think about how he breaks through for me, ecstatic praise pours out of my mouth until everyone hears how God has set me free. Many will see his miracles and they'll stand in awe of God and fall in love with him. I saw the word reactivate. It suddenly changed to mandate. I had a vision. This, there is such a fresh commissioning and mandate upon those of you who have been knocked around and knocked out by the battle. I saw encounters with Jesus taking place in profound and surprisingly unexpected ways where there will be a fresh commissioning, a release of the mandate of heaven upon you. This is a fresh recommissioning and awakening taking place over many to the mandate of Jesus. He came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Amen. baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. There are also new mandates being released from the Lord with specific assignments for this new era upon those of you who have been through these ferocious battles. The restoration and reactivation that's taking place within you will not only set you on your feet again, completely restored, but position you in a place of empowerment, of seeing the wind of the Spirit blow fiercely behind you to cause you to run into new territories before you. Many who will run in this hour with the fire of the Spirit will be the most unlikely, unexpected, and their testimonies will be stunning on the power of God bringing restoration and awakening in their, in their lives. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us, the divine reactivation of God upon those who have been in the ferocious battles is taking place now. You are being branded by the hand of God as unstoppable. You are being set to run in victory like never before. You will run in the victory of Christ in the place of overcoming and empowerment. The trauma, pain, battle wounds, all that you've endured in body, mind, soul, heart, and spirit will be healed, revealed, broken off of you, and restored by the hand of God in this divine reactivation. So, Father God, we praise you. We give you thanks and honor and glory, God, that you are reactivating, that you are restoring, that you are empowering, God. And all these that went through the battle, God, you are looking at them, Father God. You're not going to be in that place very much longer. The Lord said he can do it in a day. Believe him because he's a big God. And Lord, we just praise you and thank you for what you're doing, God. In advance, you're doing it for us, in us, and through us. To you belongs the honor and the glory. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Good to have you if you're joining us for the first time. I'm Don, I'm one of the pastors here. This is Don, he's one of the water boys here. <laughs> um, let's see, I have to look at my notes from Caitlin because that is my brain. Um, oh yeah, I've already welcomed everybody. So now I get to dismiss any kids that might still be in here. I get to dismiss you to Sunday school now. And so this is the time to go. And then I'm going to call up the ushers, whether they be male or female, and we're going to take this morning's tithes and offerings. As you can see on the board, there are a number of ways that you can give. Um, you can text it. You can give online. You can give, give us cash or a check or, yeah, all of that stuff. So however you choose to give, we are blessed that you do, and you will be blessed when you do. So, Father, I thank you for, um, for the words you gave us this morning. I thank you, Lord, that, that you have commissioned us to things, and Lord, that it, 
Yeah, it is messy, painful, and difficult at times, and sometimes we, we do get tired. But Lord, it is such a joy to, um, to be used by you. So Father, I pray that every penny that is given this morning would be used only for your purposes. Lord, that lives would be changed and that people would come to know you through these gifts we bring this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, goodness. There's so many things I want to share this morning. And just praying, Lord, would you just help me to um, get away from all the fluff and just say what you want to say this morning. Um, just love you, Lord, and I love what, what you're doing in us. Amen. So a number of years ago, um, I went to a, uh, and I've told you this story before, but for some reason I felt like I was supposed to tell it this morning as I was sitting here. Went to a cigar shop with a friend of mine to have a cigar and just kick back and relax, because that's what you do with cigars. And um, while we were there, uh, a couple of guys uh, were there, and the other guys were there, and um, then a couple more guys came in, and they said, hey guys, um, you can stay here if you want, but we're going to have a Bible study right now, and so we're going to turn off the TV and stuff, and, and we just need to let you know that we're going to be doing that here. Now you can just sit here and listen if you want, or there's another room, another part in the lounge, and, and we could go there, and, and I thought, well, that's interesting. So they were going through, I stayed, because um, I hadn't ever thought of doing a Bible study in a cigar shop before. Because for me, you know, that's, I, I tried to hide my cigar smoking for a while, because you know, a lot of people tell me it's not Christian, because Jesus never smoked cigars. <laughs> um, but I just know he invented them, so. Um, <laughs> No, it's, it's holy smoke, and that's why I do it. Um, anyway, while we were there, um, they were going through Matthew, and they are going through Matthew 9. And I was reminded of this as we were in worship, and I just want to read this to you. Because, honestly, that day in my life set me on a new course. Um, it, it impacted me and continues to impact me in a way that I can't completely explain. And I can tell you that it's impacted me in a way that it's been messy, painful, ex um, it's been expensive, um, it's been all of that stuff. It's been time consuming, um, but it's become the most joyful season of my life. And here's what we read that evening. Matthew 9, verse 36 through 38. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them, for they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. I think sometimes we talk about um, revival like it's something that's coming. Mm. We talk about revival like it's something that we're waiting for, we're praying for, we're, we're believing for. Revival. When it comes, it's going to be awesome. And, and I, I just have to say, I don't think that that's what Jesus is saying. He... See, revival's waiting. It's waiting for us. That's good. Seeing the people. He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited. Distressed, I had to look it up while we were sitting there. Extreme anxiety, sorrow, and pain. Right. They were distressed. Seeing them, he saw that they were distressed. They were dispirited. That's a loss of enthusiasm or hope. Yep. This is what Jesus saw when he looked out among the community that he was in. And, and I want you to notice, he doesn't say, pray that something will happen to them. He says, 
look at, listen, the, the workers are few. He says it to his disciples, pray that the Lord of the harvest will raise up workers. There's so much work to do. One of the things I've been feeling lately um, is I don't have enough time. You know, everywhere I go, I'm finding there are people that are hungry for hope. I mean, really, hungry for hope. I spoke about a little girl I met last week because Megan is in jail, and in jail, you know, you think, well, how could God have purpose in jail? Well, this girl comes by and sees Megan, and they get to talking, and, and then Megan says, you need to meet my pastor, and, and then I, I get to go to jail, and I meet her, and she's just this amazing young lady that's been on drugs since she was 12 years old. Her testimony, her life, you listen to it, and you just want to weep. And she just sat there and cried the whole time we talked. Now, Megan was a lot of work. Uh, every week I go to see Megan, I leave money on her books. That's just me. That's not the church. That's I do that because I love her. Now I leave money on two people's books. It gets expensive. <laughs> it's time consuming. I spent a whole day waiting um, for, her name is Amanda, for Amanda, um, for her court date. I got there at 8.30. And I had all kinds of appointments that I thought I'd be able to make, and I didn't, wasn't able to make any of them. One um, we had to push back that I was able to make, but it was 3 o'clock before they ever called her. And I was there all day. And I was the only one left in the courthouse. She was the very last person called. And you know what? It made it all worthwhile when I saw her walk through the door and into the gate, and the first thing she did was look to see if I was there. And then she smiled. Guys, I'm not even on notes right now. I'm just telling you from my heart. Come on, Don, this is good. Guys, we, yeah. we have people out there that are hurting. They are distressed. And, and we can't just sit and pray for revival. I'm sorry. We can't. Because Jesus has already answered the prayer. Yeah. He's already answered that prayer. Um, he said, you are the revival. Go into all the world. See, he says, I've given you the message of hope. I've given you hope. It's not about praying for it to come. It's already here, and he's waiting for us, those of us that believe, to literally just go out. And it's, I'll tell you, it's not hard finding people that need Jesus. It's just not hard. And so I've been doing a lot during the weeks of just being with people that don't know him. And, and then just uh, trying to pray, God, okay, uh, I don't know what to do really, but I'm just going to love on him and, and I just know that Holy Spirit, I'll do my job, you do your job, and this is going to be really, really good. And it is. So I can tell you in my life right now, somebody I was talking to him the other day, and, and I'm just like, I've got more joy in my life than I've ever had. I, I can't tell you. It's like, I'm really, really tired, but I want to go out and do it some more. You see, I believe that as, as you give away the love that God has given you, I mean, listen to this. He said, in as much as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. If you want more of God, then go to the least and give it away and love on them. Because what happens is, it's almost like you feel his joy in his presence that comes on you in a way you never, ever felt it. That's me. I've never felt this before. It's like, as I give it to people... It, it's, it's him, literally him going, thank you, and just giving it back to me. And so I just, I just have a ball with it. I get tired. I don't have enough hours in the day to do all that needs to be done. The, the fields are ready for harvest. The workers are few. We've been talking a little about practical evangelism. We're in the middle of a series called Practical Evangelism. 
And, and we started a, a few weeks ago, I talked about why Jesus came. He, he came to seek and save the lost. That was, that was his primary purpose for coming, okay? That's number one. And then, what does he do? He calls his disciples and he says, follow me and I will, what? Make you fishers of men. In, in other words, I will teach you to seek and save the lost, to do what I do, fish for men. And then, when he gets ready to go home to the Father after he rises from the dead, about 40 days later, after meeting with them more and meeting with all kinds of people, he meets them on a mountain and he commissions them. See, that's where the revival began. That was the commissioning for revival. That was now, the workers of you go now out and begin to harvest. It wasn't pray more for revival. I don't mind praying for revival, but here's how I pray for revival. Father, the workers are few. Would you call more out into the field? Would you, would you take them out of the pews and out of the chairs and out of their, their, their own looking at themselves? And would you cause their eyes to be centered on other people and to see that there are people that are distressed. So, we've talked about how sometimes we think, well, it's not my calling. And yet, that's exactly what Jesus called us to do. We think, well, it's not my gifting. And it never is talked about as a gifting when we talk about evangelism. And I think some of the, the reasons that we don't go, and we talked about this as well, is that we're, we're kind of embarrassed because in the past we've had all these cheesy programs and stuff that, um, gosh, even we, if you're a believer, you were a little embarrassed by in campaigns, and you can only imagine what unbelievers felt when, when it showed up. It just wasn't real, right? It just wasn't real. It was this contrived program to try to get people to, to do what? So, as I was praying this week, I wanted to, to talk to you about um, being authentic. Um, last week, Brandon spoke about, about seeing people, about making a conscious decision to do something. He said, when you see someone, you now have to decide each time, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And you're going to either pass them by or you're going to stop and do something. You have two choices. When you see someone, you get to make those decisions. And so Brandon talked about that. And then I talked a couple of weeks ago about what it's like to go fishing, if you remember being fishers of men. And I said, first of all, you have to go to where the fish are. Second, you need to understand the fish's tendencies. You get, need to get to know people, okay, which takes a lot of time, um, and it's not always convenient, but you get to know them, and then you need to be aware of your presentation to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, our presentation is, is probably the most vital thing that we have when it comes to people accepting or, or just... Um, What's the word? Accept? Rejecting. Thank you. I didn't get it. That's why I have a wife. <laughs> or, that, you know why? I couldn't think of rejecting because she never rejects me. Oh, and I, so it's like, she's always receiving me. Um, so the other side, I hardly know rejection. Um, no, whether they receive or they reject the message, it's almost always on presentation. Almost always on presentation. And so I want to look at a little closer at presentation this morning. A few years ago, Andre Agassi did a commercial for Rebel cameras. And at the end of the commercial, there's this wind, remember he had the long hair, and there's this wind blowing in his long hair. And he says to the camera, he looks into the camera and he says, perception is everything. And I thought, well, perception, 
do we really live by perception? Do we really chase after things like perception being perceived as something? And so I thought we go go ahead and show that video now. High karate aftershave. Just one whiff drives women wild. Makes men irresistible. High karate aftershave. Be careful how you use it. I love that commercial growing up. Do you know what I did? I went out and bought high karate. I did. I really did. I went out and I bought high karate because I, I believed. If you use a little too much of it, you are irresistible. You are. And so, so wouldn't that be awesome? There's this perception. That's what, all commercials are this way. Watch, watch commercials that say, if you have this, then you'll... There's a promise, right? There's always a promise with it. But what's, what's interesting is a promise is never reality. Now, what's, what's also interesting in, in, for me is a lot of people try to live in kind of their perception of something. I, I, I see this in the church a lot, okay? They, they, they've been told, okay, you've got to do this. You've got to look like this, talk like this, jump like this. You have to have this vocabulary. You need to learn all these weird things. And, and then you're like us, and then you're going to have everything you want. You're going to be joyful, and all this Christian life's going to be, all your problems are gone. I remember people saying, just receive Jesus, and all your problems are gone. Okay, and, and you know, I, I got to tell you the truth. I received Jesus, and... I still have problems. I still have problems. Perception, it, it, it's not reality. But it, it really is kind of how people want to interpret reality to be. Okay, and so, I find that life inside the church and life outside the church, we, we tend to present ourselves in a certain way, hoping to be received and believed. I don't care if you're a Christian or not. It's like, oh, I'm an individual, but I look like all my friends. We all dress alike, our haircut's the same, all of that. We talk the same, but we're individuals. So that's why we do this. Okay? Um, we do that outside the church, and we do that inside the church as well. We want people to believe that everything's good with us. Everything's good. Our lives may be falling apart, but you would never know it by looking at our Facebook. <laughs> our marriage, it may be on the brink of failure, but when we come to church together, no one will ever know by looking at us. We put on a perception. We want people to perceive something that may or may not be true. This is why I, I love watching commercials. You see, it's important, quite honestly, that we as Christians learn to be authentic. Number one complaint. I was with somebody last night. He said, Don, I'm going to tell you the truth. I didn't come to Jesus because of all the love. I came to him because something scared the hell out of me. I got scared into the kingdom. He says, quite honestly, when I looked at Christians, I didn't want to go there. I don't want to be like them. I didn't want to go where they went. I didn't want to be like them. Now he is. He's, a, he's a, a, an amazing Christian. But can I tell you the truth? He doesn't go to church. Why? Because he doesn't like the religiosity and the, the face that people put on in church. We do. We, do. We, we tend to live this Life. I'm not everybody, and I'm not being super critical of it. I think our church is different than most. He has visited here, and he said he did say your church is different. He really feels the love that you guys give. But I'm talking about people in general going out. First of all, they don't even see us. They don't, because a lot of Christians don't spend time with non-Christians. They don't. Some don't even know non-Christians, which is like puzzling to me. So I'm going to actually, right here, I'm going to say this. I want you guys to try to sit down and figure out 
10% of your time, I want you to tithe your time. <laughs> Come on. I want you to tithe 10% of your time to hang out with non-Christians. Just 10%, okay? Look at your day, look at your week, and say, okay, how do I carve out this about how many hours I got that I'm awake? Now I'm going to take 10% and I'm going to hang out with non-Christians. Now, I don't want you to be too Christian, or what you say is Christian, in front of them. I want you to get to know them, and get to love them, and listen to them. Don't try to save them yet. Okay? 10% of your time. I'm getting so away from everything. I have no idea where I am. Being authentic. <laughs> So what does authentic Christianity look like? There's two things. First of all, be real in your actions. Be off, to be authentic means to live your life in a way that backs up your claims. If you want revival, back it up. If you're claiming that revival is here or coming, then go and bring revival. Don't sit around and pray, because God's already sent you for it. He's answered the prayer. Now it's time. So, live in a way that backs up your claims. Be hearers and doers of the word. Now, that's really hard, honestly. Come on. You come in here every week and listen to this big, fat, bald-headed, ugly guy. Get up here. who can barely talk and tell you things. You're hearing things. Okay? But I will be honest. If, if you're like me, and I even get up here and talk. Sometimes people go, what would you talk on this week? I go, ah. Oh, it was something out of the Bible. Better already. Yeah. Something out of the Bible. Be hearers and doers of the word. Do you go out and practice it? Just go out and practice it. That's what I'm asking us to do as a, as a body of believers. Okay? So, live what you say and believe. Jesus says this in Ephesians. He says, you are the salt of the earth, and if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. If we're going to be salty Christians... Jesus calls us to be, then it takes steps of self-examination. If we're going to be who Jesus wants us to be, guys, it really takes time. We have to stop and say, okay, who are we really? Who am I really? Okay? I want to examine that. Am I, am I really living what I claim? Or, or if you don't know God, who am I really? It, it, we're not going to go anywhere until we're honest with anything. Until we're authentic with anything. So you live what you believe. Self-examination. See, people are looking to see if our beliefs and claims are congruent with our speech and our actions. I've had friends that um, I went to high school with Every time I go back for one of our reunions, the last one was 40, I literally have friends come up and say, I had one come to me uh, last time, a guy named Mike. And he says, the reason I'm a Christian is because of you. I have watched your life all of these years, and you still believe it. And I looked into it, and he accepted Jesus. That, honestly, somebody tells you that, you're going, really? Wow. Literally watched me. You see, I really do believe what I say, and I try to live it out. This is what a quote from a guy named Bill Hybels. If we want to be, if we want to have the kind of impact that salty Christians uh, should have, he says, Jesus said we need to be, or that Jesus said we need to be. We're going to have to first take some preliminary steps of self-examination and be willing to make any needed character adjustments. We must start by making certain that the way we're living backs up the words we're speaking. Authentic identity. We have to live what we speak 
And I'm going to now just jump forward because we're about out of time. Here's another thing that, can I just tell you, this gets my goat. We have to be authentic about how we feel. We have to be honest about our struggles. We have to be honest about our pain. You see, because the world has no hope if all we have is we say, oh yeah, God will take care of that. And you have no empathy, no experience, no. But you, you have to deny it because you're told by certain teachers that <clears throat> if you feel that, it's a lack of faith. So don't, don't say that. Don't speak that. I got a call from somebody this week. I don't think they're here. I'm really depressed, Pastor Don. I said, okay. No, no, I, I'm really depressed. I go, I'm so sorry. I know what depression is like, and it's no fun at all. But I'm not supposed to be depressed. Well, why not? Because people tell me that if I'm a Christian... I'm not supposed to be depressed. That, that it's a lack of faith. And is there something wrong with me? We, we want to sometimes just deny what we're feeling. Yeah. Guys, let's be authentic. You see, this is what I like about us. God made each of us individual. He... I guess he sat down. I don't know. I kind of picture him sitting down. He said, okay, I'm going to now make Dawn. <laughs> so he sat down. And he pondered for a very long time. And you know what? In each one of us, you're uniquely designed. You're not deficient. Amen. Amen. God formed you. And when the world tells you or someone tells you that you should be someone other than yourself, you know what I say about should. See, should, the word should is often, what it is, is it's like, um, okay, you should do this. In other words, for you to be acceptable, for you to be, um, I don't know, a real person, you should do this. For you to be a real Christian, you should, you should, and I, can I just tell you, I get calls every, every week, or I meet with people every week that are just devastated because of the shoulds in their life. Mm -hmm. Just devastated. And, and well, maybe I, I need to do this because so-and-so told me I have to do this, and so-and-so said I should look like this, or, and it's like, no, you're unique. There's no should in, in, in that kind of thing in your life. You're unique. God, God made you that way. He gave you your, your, your character. Gave you your personality. He gave you all that you are. And please, embrace what he has done. He has made something special. You know, I think about... Um, People like this week, these people came to mind. Caitlin. And, and do you know there's something unique about Caitlin that is unique to Caitlin? And here's what Caitlin told me early on. She said she wanted to work with poor children from the time she can remember. Yeah, now, that doesn't make much sense to me. But that's what drove her and continues to drive her. It's who... Caitlin is. It's something that God put in Caitlin. I think about Brian, the guy that she married. And what I'm learning is Brian is a guy that seeks adventure. He had to if he married Caitlin. And Brian gets really excited about new things. If you're ever with Brian and there's something new like earthworms, Brian purchased some earthworms. 
And he like he woke up in the morning and he's kind of tossed around and Caitlin looks over and says, what are you thinking about? And he looks over and he says, I'm telling on you. Is this okay if I tell the story? Okay. If not, I'll cut it off and everyone will wonder. So Brian's kind of tossed around. It's early in the morning and Caitlin goes, what are you thinking about? He goes, oh, I'm thinking about how much I love you, honey. Yeah. And she goes, no, you're not. You're thinking about the earthworms. <laughs> and he had to go quickly to go see the earthworms. That's Brian. That's unique. Okay? I don't know a lot of people like Brian. You see the uniqueness in us? Brandon, he's designed to organize things. Brian, it's just how he works. It's, it, or Brandon, I'm sorry. Brandon, it's, it's how he works. He's unique. I love having him on staff because he has all the things, not all of them, but many of the things I don't. You're unique, all of you. Aaron, he's unique in his passion. Seriously. He's unique in his, he's expressive in his art and in his music. See, God designed him that way and he designed each one of you just the way you are. It doesn't mean you're perfect. Amen. No, it doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you don't deal with the things in your life that you need to deal with. But it does mean is, guys, you got something no one else does, and God gave it to you for purpose. And the purpose was to share it with others that need it. That's, there are other people out there that need hope. And, and what you've been through or what you're going through when you share real authentic life with them it brings them hope yeah. I struggle with depression sometimes I remember the first time I came home Kelly says how are you doing and I said I'm depressed today and she goes of course she thought she did something wrong right what do I, what do, I do no you didn't do it I just I'm depressed I, sometimes I, and I never told her that I get depressed. Okay, but I knew, okay, I'm depressed today, and I, I know from experience that I may not be depressed tomorrow, but it's okay if I'm a little depressed, because eventually I'm gonna be okay. Okay, and, and when I am depressed, I can talk to people now about it. Okay, and, and, and I don't want them to tell me how to not be depressed because it's a lack of faith. I want them to go, man, oh, I'm so sorry. I worked through that kind of stuff too. It's just not easy. Thank you. That brings me hope. You see it? Come on. Anyway. Jesus was a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. He knows everything we feel. He was honest about it. He was authentic. You see. When people tell you if you're a Christian, you should never be depressed, angry, sad, hurt, or show, or show lasting signs of grief. These are all signs to me of shallow faith and a lack of trust in God. Not appropriating what he has accomplished for us on the cross. You see, for the follower, there is hope. No matter what you're going through, there's hope. So what do I offer people that are being harassed, who are helpless, hope. Amen. If we don't bring it, who will? Suicide's going off the charts, lack of hope. I don't want to sit and pray about suicide anymore. I want to go out and love the person who's just about there. Amen. I do. Guys, we can't. this is life and death. And so I'm now begging you, as you go, as you go, take the hope that is in you. See people. Make the decision when you see them. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a big thing. I saw a guy the other day, I could tell he was homeless, and I have these gift cards my daughter gave me for Taco Bell, and I just walked up, and I said, hey, how you doing? We talked for a minute, I go, you hungry? He goes, yeah. I said, you know, I have this gift card. I just want to give it to you. It's $10. There's Taco Bell right over there. And that was it. She said, what? He had hope for a meal. 
and someone saw him. Someone saw him. I won't continue on. I don't want to preach too much. See, Jesus created you to be unique. So I'm going to encourage you, please, be authentically you. Okay? And don't, please don't, put your stuff on someone else. See people the way they are and love the uniqueness of who they are, who Jesus made them to be. They don't need to be like anyone else. They need to be like the person that Jesus created them to be, and they need to be encouraged to be more and more and more free to be who they are. And then they live your life in a way that you're congruent inside and out with what you do and what you feel. Be congruent. Let people see you. Is that all right? Is this an, I'm sorry, is this like Good. too heavy? Good. Good. I, I didn't laugh a lot. Um, guys, I'm so encouraged by you guys and what I'm seeing happening. And some of what you're hearing this morning is just, for me, I'm tired. And I think that Jesus was tired. When he turned and he saw the crowds, it's just too much. So he says, please pray that God will raise up people that they will see that that is what they're called to do. Now, that they would go and see the field is white for harvest, guys. It's so white for harvest. So I won't go on. I could get going on something else. Father, we're going to close with this. Father, I, I love, I just got to tell you, I love what you've done in me since that one evening in a cigar shop and how you showed me that we don't even look at the fields I don't even look at the fields I don't look for them and now Lord you're opening my eyes to the fields and in the last year this field of people who are homeless and people who are on drugs and people who are in jail Lord, I thank you that you've entrusted your message to me. And that you've entrusted your message to all of us here. To go and bring hope to a world that is distressed. To go and love people that really don't know love well. And that don't trust well. That we could go out and love them. Father, I thank you that there's a group of people in this room today that you're sending out in their uniqueness of individuality and however and wherever they go. Lord, I just pray that you will use them. Just let them see someone. And then, Lord, I just pray that you would unleash their uniqueness on those people. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen, guys. I'm sorry there's no song to send you out. I could sing, but you wouldn't want me to. So... Yes, we Bless will. you all. And there's donuts in the donut room. If you're visiting, join us, I pray. Amen.